What's it like living in Spain and moving into Spain after Brexit? And would you like some top tips about moving to and living in Spain? Well, you're in the right place. I'll be joined shortly on the virtual settee by the virtual pool by our very good friend and admin of the Facebook group After Brexit in Spain, Rachel Warns. And she'll be giving her top tips and answering all of your questions too. So stick around and get yourself a mention in the live chat or in the comments below. Uh, Rachel is on a satellite feed or a phone feed this morning, so if we have any technical issues, we'll keep the show going for you. So, gather round, it's time for our small but perfectly formed cosmic theme tune. Get ready to dance, here it comes. <laughs> There it is. So very quickly before I bring in Rachel, two very quick pieces of important information just for you. Number one, check out our really helpful website, u2spain.com, for more amazing information, blog articles and resources just for you. There's a free newsletter every month too, so if you sign up over the next three days, you'll get that at the start of March. And number two, all of this helpful information and fun that you get from U2 Spain on YouTube and on the website and on Facebook, it's all absolutely free. But if you appreciate the value of it, please help us to continue doing it by using the links in the video description below, where you can not only donate via Patreon or buymeacoffee.com, there's also a QR code just here on your screen right now, which won't be there for the whole show, but you can always access it afterwards by coming back to the video, but or use the link below anyway. But from all of those links that are down below, you can get discounts on some vital services that you need for your move to Spain and for your life here. All of those companies are tried and tested. They all support us every time you use the links, and that doesn't cost you a penny, which is wonderful. One thing that I dropped the ball on when I moved here was not sorting out my method of currency exchange well in advance. It can make a really big difference because if you've been watching the exchange rates, the pound especially has, uh, has plummeted quite a lot over the last few years. So there's a link below to get a free account with Smart Currency Exchange so you can speak to an advisor for free and you can do something called fixing the forward exchange rate. You can fix it on a really good day when it's really high and then you don't have to pay in advance. You just kind of pay a deposit and then uh, so ask them all about that. They'll give you all of the details. I won't explain it all right now. And that's good for if you're buying a house, for example, or moving um, or sending your pension or investment money or just even paying your utility bills if you don't live in Spain. They can do all of that for you at the same rate for a whole year or even longer so that you're not at the whim of the exchange rates cost nothing to set up an account and talk to them. So register now. It's a win, 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 win with a cherry on top. There we go. So without further ado, let's meet our wonderful guest. It's Rachel from After Brexit in Spain. Good morning, Rachel. Good How morning. Are you doing um, all right. Just, I'm, I'm enjoying a bit of snow that we've had here. It's not quite, it's a bit about the same as in the background here. Well, it's not real. <laughs> Yeah, mine's not real either. It's a bit chilly outside. That's why I'm rubbing my hands here and I've got a heater next to me. But you're, you're way further up north than me, aren't you? Yep. Not much further north than this. We, well, I guess Bay Vasco is slightly higher than we are, but uh, up in Astorius, we are fairly northern. So, mm. And we have mountains. So. Yes, you're certainly more northern than I am. I'm right down south. So, uh, But still, it gets chilly. That's something that a lot of people oh, yeah. don't know when they're expecting yeah. to move to Spain. You get even down south gets chilly in the winter exactly. it can do. Yeah, exactly frost so, is on the island and all that this week so mm. anyway welcome back to the show it's been a while since we had the benefit of your experience and uh, for those of you who are who aren't aware of after brexit in spain it's probably the most detailed and well informed of all of the so-called expat groups we'll talk about that term in a minute i'm sure um because Rachel answers everyone's question at great length and supports everything with <laughs> links to government websites, official sites, and she takes pride in uh, in getting those answers really right. And it's a really helpful and supportive group. It encourages positivity and discourages trolls. Anything else you'd like yeah. to add to that description? Well, don't forget Sally as well, because our, our other admin, um, Sally, does. Uh, she's sort of 
we do sort of separate things. So she's expert on one thing and I do the other thing. So we sort of share the job between us. And we have, because our two ladies who do all the, uh, at the gate, stopping these trolls getting in. So uh, we've got uh, um, Helen and uh, Jackie who do all that sort of checking everybody out, making sure no one's coming in who we don't want. So our mm -hmm. bouncers. So Brilliant. It's a, good, it's a great team. So. Yes. Hello to all of the team. Hello, Sally. And um, yeah, so do you have any other shout outs to anybody you'd like to say hello to this morning? No, just hello to all the people who are both groups are after a Brexit Spain people and of course the, the Scats, the Scats fans. So we have a, yes. a good crossover between the two because I think we, we mention you quite a lot and you mention us quite a lot. So it's, uh, it's always good. Like yeah, that. absolutely. And you, you drop my yeah. little Wednesday videos in there as, a, as kind of yeah. fun examples to go along yeah, with exactly. your information. Exactly. There we go. Let's just say hello to the people on the live chat. We have Bev, uh, Beverly Gray, who asked a question on After Brexit in Spain. We'll come to that in a bit, Bev. And uh, Maff. Hello, Maff. I think it's uh, first time on the live chat there. I've been speaking to Maff all about his situation on, on our group. Buenos dias. And uh, Janet, good morning. Um, Anton Cares, that's AK Mitchell. Hola todos there over in France. And uh, Maff says, great tip about the money. Thanks. We'll check that out. Janet says, I've been using them for seven years. Excellent service. There we go. Phil Quantrill, morning all from Phil and Kimberley. They've already moved. They're in sunny Mojaca Playa. There we go. And Tony Carlos, morning. Yes, hope you're well too, Tony. Thanks for joining us. There we go. So shall we do some top tips first? Have you got a, a little list for us? Fire away. Well, yes, yes. Oh. well... First of all, starting from scratch, the people who aren't here yet, those those of you in other countries who are thinking of coming to Spain, first thing, arm yourself with the information because, it, yeah, it's not as easy as it used to be. If you're a UK citizen, that is. If you're a EU citizen, and obviously carry on, it's very easy. But um, if you're a UK citizen, yeah, arm yourself with what you need to come here and sort of and really get your head around what it involves. It's, it is difficult. It's not impossible, though. So that's the second tip. Don't get put off by the mm -hmm. fact that it's difficult because there's a lot of people say, oh, you can't do it anymore. It's impossible for UK people to move here. You can't work here. You can't retire here. You can. It's harder to do, but you can do it. So mm -hmm. those are the top ones. Make sure you know what you you let yourself in for, know how much money you're going to be needing or how much work you're going to have to put into getting a working visa because they're possible as well. Mm -hmm. Plus the money's then less because you've got to be earning when you get here, so you don't have to have that big lump of money in the bank. But yeah, be be honest with yourself about what it's going to involve, and it's it's also long haul because it won't be a case of you can move tomorrow. You can't move tomorrow because you've got a lot of things to get in place before you can move. So mm -hmm. yeah, be be realistic, but don't be put off. Is mm -hmm. my, is my is the, how long really. how long in advance should you be planning all of this? I would say if you're thinking of retiring in the future, as in any point in the future, start looking now because you can get yourself in a really good position then. If you've got two or three years to retirement, that you can start putting things together at this moment, which will mean it's, it's easy in three years' time because you can put the money in the bank and you can pay yourself and what you need. Um, you won't cut left. Mm. <laughs> and then uh, it's, if you come here to work, then you're going to have to put yourself again. Um, if you're going to work for yourself, your own business, to look what kind of businesses you want to do, that's going to take a bit of time to research. Think about what qualifications you're going to need because they're going to want to see you can do this job. So if you want to do something in Spain a later date, think about doing it now in the UK so you've got that experience behind you. So you can say, look, I've done this for a year in the UK. I want to do this in Spain now. It's mm -hmm. just my, my history on that. So you, it's really it's thinking as far in advance as you can about what you want to do in the future. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you've got time to research where you want to live, what places you want to be in, if you want to be near people or away from people, mm -hmm. you know, what connections you need to have with either the other side of the water or in Spain itself. So it's sort of as soon as you can start thinking about it, no matter how far it is in the future, think about it now. Mm -hmm. is the, Brilliant. Is the tip on that one. Very, very good tip. And there's certain things that you need to to kind of organize you need to organise your money. You need to know what's what's exactly. happening with your money if you weigh in advance. So it's it's worth even yeah. talking to a wealth management specialist and sort out what your exactly, pension yeah, is going to yeah. be many years in advance because uh, you don't yeah, want to think about have things like ices and that kind of thing that you can't bring with you. How how can you put those in a place that's going to be better for you when you come to Spain? So you can say, look, I've got this money because it's not going to work for you in the UK anymore because you you don't be a tax resident there, so you're not going to get interest 
or, or you're gonna get you're gonna pay tax on it, I should say, it's not gonna be tax free anymore. So yeah. those kind of things that you're gonna once you get to Spain, you're not gonna take advantage of. Think about putting them somewhere where you can take advantage of them when you get to Spain or to get you to Spain. Mm-hmm. Instead of sort of holding them in a in a in a pot in the UK that's it's got a tax advantage there, but it hasn't here. It's it, there's no there's no point then. Mm-hmm. Very true. Here. And we'll talk about and Bev's point is all about bringing your belongings over. We'll uh, yeah, actually do um, uh, give us your next top tip and then we'll move on to Bev's question. Well, that's it, it kind of rolls together. It's that's about planning ahead and what you want to do, what you want to bring with you here to Spain, because you're not always going to got a house full of furniture. And it's probably lovely furniture and everything, but you might not be able to use it when you get here because it might not fit where you're going to live or you might have to rent for a while when you first get here because it's never a good idea to buy straight away if you don't know an area. It's better to rent, and then you've got problems if it's, if it's furnished. Or well, you might buy a house that's furnished, in actual fact, because you can easily buy a house mm. here that's fully furnished. I've bought two here that have been fully furnished. So mm. if you're thinking about bringing furniture, think about really what you want to bring with you, because mm. you might end up having to pay tax on that when you bring it. You shouldn't if you're moving here, but you might end up having to pay tax on it, and then when you get it here, you might not be able to use it. So it's mm. kind of... Think about what it is, streamline your life hmm. to what you're going to do in the future. Don't think about what you've got now. Think about what you might need later when you've actually got here. That's hmm. what that sort of falls into Bev's question really about um, that kind of thing, about, about bringing your things with you. Yeah, it's true. I know it's, if you do what we did in Ireland when we moved over from the UK to Ireland, it wasn't until we'd been there for two or three years we were both self-employed. So... This relates to the fact that we moved to a place which was absolutely beautiful, right on the coast, a, a little bit further away from the nearest town. We were like 15 minutes drive from the nearest small supermarket. And that meant that my wife, Liz, who has clients as a, an aromatherapist, massage therapist, she wasn't getting that many clients coming from the local yeah. town because yeah. it was all the people who lived out in the, the camper, the countryside that came to her as clients. But so we realized that after three years, we just need to move a bit closer. So we moved 10 minutes down the road, five minutes out of town. Suddenly she got an influx of clients yeah, yeah. that she needed. So it took three years for us to realize that. And even if you're retired or something, you may live out in the countryside in the campo just a little bit too far from and you realize you've got to drive everywhere even to go for your local pint yeah, or, yeah. or yeah. For, a, for a meal so yeah that was all it is an accident or an illness what <laughs> means you can't drive and suddenly you're you're, you're out on a limb aren't you you're, you're reliant on the non get taxis or friends to take you and things so Mm. It's, and if you, I mean, I only, I'm only five minutes from town by car, and I can mm-hmm. I can walk there quite easily. But uh, yeah, there's there's definitely if you're far away, mm-hmm. far away, you're always far away. No one moves it. So. Yeah, and another thing about bringing your belongings, if you suddenly find once you're spending time in Spain and you realise that your best, your the loveliest place that you've found, that the place that you really want to live and feel comfortable in, happens to be in the middle of a a little hilltop village, a beautiful Pueblo Blanco, <laughs> then there's a very good chance that you're not going to be able to get the removal van up the street yeah. where the property also is yeah. or get the stuff out of the property because the owner of the property that's selling it might not want to do that kind of yeah. but that taking all of the property, uh, taking all of his belongings out and yeah. all of the old furniture because it costs a bit because you can't get a skip up the street and throw all of the rubbish in there. It's so, funny, yeah. yeah, think about that. It's not until you start carrying a bed frame <laughs> down a very small street, uh, down 100 metres to get to the nearest yeah. place where you can park a van, that you yeah. realise yeah. that you shouldn't have moved your furniture at all. You know. Exactly. So let's get on to Bev's question, actually. Let's put it up on the screen and we can talk about that now. Here we go. Let's share that. What's that one called? Question one. There is only one big question there. Bev Gray. So let's just move that uh, QR code off the screen because it's getting in the way now. Uh, but, but, but there we go. So Bev says, is there a limited time that you have to bring your belongings over without import tax implications? They're getting residency, not visas. We were thinking of renting for six to nine months before we buy, so we're going to leave most of our belongings in storage in the UK until we have our own property. It will only be personal or sentimental items, no furniture. So, 
There we go. Your answer that you've actually put an answer yes. after that on your group there. But um, tell us the basic answer. <laughs> Yeah, the basic answer is uh, it's one of those very famous. It depends, uh, but <laughs> it's there's no well, that, I've never been able to find it any set period of time. I didn't say six months after you moved, a year after you moved. There's there's no there's no limit been written down anywhere that I can find. It some of it comes down to common sense. If you're moving stuff that's obviously new, uh, you've bought since you've lived here. Like you've been here for two years and you've got something that's only a year old, then you've bought that since you've moved here that's you're going to end up really get taxed on that even if it's more than the six months old because that six months is a six month limit if something's less than six months old you will definitely get taxed no matter who you are when you move what date you move your stuff if it's less than six months old that's taxable mm -hmm. if you've bought stuff since you've moved it it starts getting a bit of a gray area because you've not bought that as when you've been a resident in spain you've bought that in the uk again that's a little bit mm -hmm. but if you've had something for years and years and years and you bring it here 18 months later then you've owned that for years and it'd be obvious that you've owned it for years because i mean the customs guys know what things look like they know furniture's old or furniture's new or washing machines this year's uh -huh. model or five years old model so it it's always going to be down to what they see in your load as to as opposed to how long it was since you started your residency here because there's no there's no sort of strict right you've, you've been here for a year that's it you can't have your stuff anymore because people do move in stages I mean, we moved in stages and um, we did we only moved into one house but we didn't bring all things in at one one shot we brought it in over time because we sold our house after we moved here so mm. we had furniture that was useful here a lot of stuff we got rid of but that was after the event although this because of pre-brexit so the the customs bit was obviously a lot less important it was still had to write a list and, and make sure you got it noted down but there was no um, tax obligation because we were in the customs union then but it's there's it is that that common sense if you've had your stuff in storage for 18 months have that receipt for that stuff in a storage and even if you can't persuade the customs guy on the day you move or the day you bring it in I should say you can go to get a hester on your side and get him to fill the paperwork get your evidence together and you can claim that money back as well so there's there is ways of getting the money back if you do have to pay even though you feel you shouldn't have paid Mm -hmm. If tax was due and tax was due, and you got no way of saying it was it wasn't due, then obviously you can't do that. And if you get taxed and you can't get it back, just think on the grounds that if you bring stuff with you and that stuff you want to bring with you, you you want that stuff with you, and it's you know it's, it's precious to you. Then if you've got to pay twenty one percent of its second hand value to get it here, actually is that a big big punishment? Is that a, it's it's a small cost for something you want you need to have with you or you want dearly want to have with you mm. then you, you pay that, that tax and, and 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 live with it because you have to buy it new here whatever it was you would have mm. to pay more than that price so you've kind of won in a way because you've, you've you've saved yourself money not having to buy new stuff and if it's something that's dear to you then bring it with mm -hmm. you you so could always pay. you can always refashion the furniture that's in the property that you move into or yes. there are second-hand places here where you can get really lovely stuff so yeah, exactly. Exactly. There are ways of getting there's, there's, there's fantastic furniture here. I mean, people say, "Oh, British furniture is great. They got oaks better in the UK." I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> I don't know how it would. But yeah, there's there's fantastic stuff. I mean, we we say so we bought twice. We've bought houses full of furniture. I mean, like literally full of furniture, like more furniture than you can ever imagine in one space. But <laughs> alongside that, there was some really really nice stuff. Stuff that we've kept, we've refurbished, or stuff that we put out for the neighbours because here it tends to be a case of everything gets recycled on point or be used on point because we put it outside people come and collect it and there's my neighbors uh, the other house have um refurbished some coffee tables that we put out we didn't want because we had no space for them because the house was far too small for all the furniture there was yeah. they've been out they refurbished them and, and now they're in the house in madrid so it's kind of like yeah think about things think about what you need to have with you if you need to bring it with you bring it with you if you can get tax back if you get taxed you can get the tax back if that's a route for you and if not Pay the bit of money and and think yourself you you brought your thing you want with you. That's all mm -hmm. I have to say on that. One. So. Good. Phil's just added to that. It's just saying the same things really, unless you have real quality or sentimental yeah. value furniture. The cost of transports and the storage exactly. can be very prohibitive. I yeah. bought so we bought so much more. I've got a storeroom yeah. underneath where I am now, yeah. and it's full of stuff that uh, you know, I may use one day. I want. <laughs> I Eventually, the... it will come useful. You'll be like, yeah, I kept it. I'm, I've had success. Although there will be a hundred tons of stuff you'll never move ever in your life. You'll be like, why did I keep those things? I've got loads That's of cool I, I've got loads of puppets and all kinds of stuff that, oh, right. that I was using in Ireland. I used to, I had a, a theatre oh. company and everything. And I thought, you know, I I might be doing that there. And I don't want to throw them all out because it took me ages. To, some of them I made yeah, yeah. by hand, you know. So. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I didn't feel the need, but I've not used them so far. I'm not throwing them so out far. yet. That's <laughs> after the show. I mean, that's for after the show. You need to have a puppet show afterwards. That's yeah, it. yeah. I'll start a whole new <laughs> channel. Or maybe I'll just present as a puppet instead of me. You know? <laughs> there we go. So, yes, thanks for that, Phil. And uh, uh, I'm going to show what Maf said earlier. Biggest tip he has so far is that I need to sell my property first in yeah. the UK, not get caught up by capital gains tax, planning to move in late 2024. He's yeah. very excited. Yes, so. I don't blame you. Is that one of your tips as well? Capital gains. Tax? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it gets complicated enough. You've got tax advisors that come onto your show who obviously know way more about the, the, the things you can do to sort of avoid having to pay these things. But yeah, the, the easiest, the absolutely easiest way that any person can do without having to think any hard about it is sell anything that's worth a lot of money in the UK, i.e. your property, the year before you move, because that way you're always going to be clear of that tax year um, starting in Spain, which starts in January. So if mm -hmm. you can move, sell your stuff in this year move the next year, that is the far simplest way of avoiding getting penalised. There are other mechanisms, and I say I, I don't get involved in any of that because that's not anywhere near my speciality, and there's people out there who know far more about it, but yeah, mm -hmm. simple way, sell before. Move and the slightly more complicated way is to sell your property in the first half of the year and move in the second half yeah. of the year, but then, you've got to make sure you've not spent loads of days exactly. in Spain uh, on holiday in advance. You do, you do your 90 days holiday beginning of the year, you, you, you're you already 90 days in deficit, so then you've got to spend 90 days out of there at the end of the year, and it's all like, yeah. Yeah, and there once is, you've actually... There is ways of it, but you've got to be careful. And so. once you've actually moved and you've uh, got your TIE date and your resident, yeah. you can't... You, Those days you can't, don't count. Uh, yeah, you can't actually go back to the UK for, for 90 days yeah, after exactly. that so period. You can't do January, February, March here, then go back for three months and then come here for July and then go home for October, November, December. That doesn't work because those three end months will be mm. your residency months. You, you live here now, so no matter if you're not here, you are a resident here. So those three months will count. So, yeah, you'd have to then move here in October instead so that you've not you've had that six months clear in the middle. <clears throat> yes. And none of that matters if you're actually on a working visa or a self-employment visa, because the moment you start yep. working, you are Absolutely. paying tax. And, and, yeah, because um, so, yeah. yeah, I started paying tax when we, we we actually physically moved here in December. We actually didn't get residency because it was Brexit year. It was actually the first year of Brexit, so um, 2019, when it all was completely up in the air. We didn't officially get residency until May. Although I registered for work in March, so mm -hmm. I paid tax in the UK until March, and then I paid tax in Spain from March onwards because mm -hmm. that's when we became resident because we're self-employed. So we didn't have a we were only been here for a certain amount of time. It didn't count. It wouldn't have mattered because we were here. We started working here early enough for us to start on that date. Fortunately, the double tax treaty meant that we didn't pay tax for the whole year in Spain. We only paid it up to that point, and then the, the first part of the year we paid in the UK. So. There is, it is quite clever the way that UK and Spain tax authorities work with each other. They're not, it's not quite so, um, like, like an American movement here, basically it's a year and that's it. They just go, you've moved it this year, you're here this year. Whereas the UK and Spain, because they work so closely, it's actually easier to say this part of the year is your year, this part of the year is your year. So it is, mm. there is ways and means of, 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 of not of avoiding things and that, but yeah, the easiest way, do it all last year, move next year. Oh, mm. this year, this year. So. And they're still working quite in conjunction with each other. They're still swapping information, yeah, yeah, that's, even that's not even after Brexit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same now as after Brexit because it was always a separate thing. That the dual tax um, dual tax treaty is a Spain UK thing. It's not a U, an EU thing. France has one, Germany has one, Spain has one. It's not an EU has one. So it's, mm. it was never affected by Brexit. So, yeah, that's Brilliant. So. And says, don't forget to bring with you a good sense of humour. That's his top tip. Yeah, you need that, definitely. And, that, <laughs> and it's tax-free, he says. So, well, At the moment, you never know. <laughs> yes, you never know <laughs> what might happen. Spain's very good at bringing in taxes. <laughs> and, you know, it took ages, it's taken ages for the driving licence thing to go through Parliament. But if it's a tax, it doesn't take them long to get it through, does it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, unless it's, of course, it's a tax benefit, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, good. We'll have a bash at the tax man. Why not? <laughs> so, Glenn is asking all the things we need. That's good. Mm. Clutching at straws says, Glenn, my wife's grandparents were Irish, her father was UK, but she is UK born. Can she claim Irish citizenship? 
um, mm-hmm. she can um, not claim Irish citizenship. What she needs to go do is go on to the uh, what's it called the. The, there's, there's a name for it. There's a register. If you go to the uh, dfa.ie website, it will give you that information. I've also mm. done a video about this, but on their yeah. website, it will tell you what you actually need to do yeah. to and what forms to fill in. There are links to all of the forms on that website. That's yeah, the it's department. Not automatic, is it? Grandparents. Yeah. It's, it's parents. It's automatic. Well, off, mm. as grandparents, it's it's a, it's a longer route. It's a possible route, but it's, it's a longer route, isn't it? It takes takes longer and it's more complicated. Takes about two years Not at the moment. It. That's definitely worth it, though. So. Mm-hmm. so that's dfa.ie that's the department of foreign affairs but if you go uh, citizensinformation.ie is also a very good website it's not the official government one but they actually explain things a lot easier so i usually go onto that one first yeah. and then if i need the real accurate detail i go onto yeah. the dfa and then there's a then there is links that you can go to from the dfa which give you the laws in massive massive length and you've got to understand lawyer speak to do that so that's where i got all my information from but yeah the dfa is the proper official one with all the forms on it so have a look at that and if you have problems then come to me and on our facebook group and i'll point you in the right direction there we go uh another top tip then from you, Rachel. Oh, I forgot about top tips. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Things to do when you get here. So this is you've you've been successful. You've you've got your, your visa and your passport, and you've come in, and you make sure you get it stamped on the way in as well. Don't forget that one. That's a top mm. tip. Get your, get your passport page stamped with a visa on it, because otherwise you're here on Schengen time, and then the police and national get all like, well, are you here as a visa? Are you here as a tourist? Ugh. So mm. get it stamped. Unless you don't, of course, you want to go back and forth a few times before you actually physically finish, and then don't get it stamped. So <laughs> if you come in here and you want to be a resident, get it stamped on the way in. If it's here, France, wherever you come into the the Schengen zone, mm-hmm. get that stamp passport, and that because that then makes your visa. And the way it actually makes it not live anymore because it, it basically says this visa has been used. This person is now a resident. So mm-hmm. it's kind of so play that one as you as you need to because you might mm-hmm. want to bring stuff in and then come back and then go again. In which case, it's it's easy to do that way. Yeah, um, and if and if you fail to get it stamped, then you can go into the the police station. Yeah, yeah, you can. It's, it's just a it's good idea. Yeah. Mm. It's just like if you've already got your appointment, you spent ages trying to get an appointment because in some places it's really difficult to get your your, your completions appointment here in in Spain, depending on the, on your region. If you've done all that, the hassle of waiting for months trying to get it, like panicking the computer, and then you arrive and you've got this thing that's not stamped, then you're like, well, you're back at square one again. So I mean, they might be give you a favour and say, okay, we'll make your appointment. Well, they might not. You might be starting right back again, getting it stamped, and having to start another appointment. So, try try your very best to get it stamped by wherever you enter. Try and get that stamp put on that visa page, not on just any page. You put on, on the page that's your visa's opposite, kind of thing. So the, the, the clear page next to it. Which is why you need to have two empty pages on your passport. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a top tip that I didn't think about until now. <laughs> so yeah, excellent. So, do that, and then um, once you're here, once you're a resident, the, it, there's you you are a resident basically you've got no um flexibility as such you can't say well i'm, I'm only temporal i'm a, well, a temporary temporal as i call it here there's things you have to do um and some of those are, t- are time imperative so for example your driving license which i don't say at the moment is controversial <laughs> but mm. then you've got six months on a uk driving license if you've got a, a european license because you've lived somewhere else in europe first and you've, you've still got a german license whatever that's not a problem. It's a UK license. If you've got UK license, whether you're British or whatever, you've got UK license, it lasts six months once you become resident. And be aware that you become resident, in most cases, the day you cross the border, not the day you go to Policia to get your, your passport done or whatever. Mm. Have a look at your TIE because the, day, the end date on your TIE will be the day and month that they count as you have been resident from because that's it's through the 65 days. So if it says March... 2024 then from march 2023 that is a day you will become resident so even if your tie got issued two months after that development mm-hmm. that's that first day so you've got six months to get your driving license done at the moment it's 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 imminent it's imminent it's been imminent for quite a long time but imminently you should just be able to swap it all you need to do is a little medical test um it's just test your eyesight make sure your coordination skills are all right if you've mm-hmm. got any medical conditions to check to make sure what that's compatible with 
if you've got medical condition, it's a massive problem. They can just put a limit on your license. So they might say you can't drive at night time or you can drive on certain types of road. So there's, don't be put off by the fact you're going to get checked medically because that, it doesn't mean you can't drive. It just means you might have restrictions. You mm-hmm. can still carry on. And likewise, you, you, you're right, you're right, like, they might you know, say you've, got a, you've always got some glass, um, glasses in your car anyway, if you wear glasses mm-hmm. and, and things like that. So there's, 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 don't be put off by the fact you're going to get checked. Because you are going to get checked, and you get checked every time you renew, you renew the license. That happens to everybody in Spain every ten mm-hmm. years or five years if you've got um, uh, like your HGV or that kind of you've got high, higher qual- um, categories. You'll get checked every five years because your license only lasts five years. But for mm-hmm. normal car driving, it's ten years, and you'll get checked every ten years. So that's something you, that happens in Spain. People have to be healthy to be on the road, mm-hmm. which is kind of a good thing for everybody. So that's uh, so yeah, driving licenses. In most places, once it comes back online, because hey, at the moment we're on hold because this thing's not come through, you can generally do it within a few days. It, there are places where there'll be a longer queue because if you've got more, a lot of people where you live, then obviously there's a lot more people to get in the queue. But <clears> in <throat> most places in Spain, you can get your license changed within a week, generally speaking. So it's it's not, it shouldn't be arduous to do that. Mm. Um, and you can do it anywhere in Spain as well. So if you live in Madrid or Barcelona, for example, and maybe it's... The, the queue there is huge and you're going to you're wait and wait and you can't get an appointment. You don't have to do it there. You can move, go somewhere else in your region or outside your region. It doesn't matter where you are in the country. Go to DGT somewhere else and, and do it there. You have got to go twice. So bear that in mind if you've got to go a long, long distance. You might have to make two day, like day trips or weekends <clears> away. <throat> but yeah, you can get that done. And once this agreement is actually finally put out there, it should be done in, in, in days. So That's the theory. I guess there's going to be much bigger queues once that happens. There's, yeah, there's gonna be, and there's going to be places where there are a lot of British people live. Because obviously, it's, it's mostly mm-hmm. a problem for British people, or at least for UK pass, uh, UK license holders. I shouldn't say British people, UK license holders. Yeah, there are, there are places in Spain where there are a lot of people who fit in that category. But there's other places mm-hmm. in Spain where there's hardly any of us. So it's it's kind of, if you need to have a day trip to Asturias or a weekend away to Asturias, go there, get off the train in Oviedo. The DGT is like literally two minutes, if that, from the, the station. Mm-hmm. Do it. Do swap that. Then come back for a day trip later in the year. Oh, well, later, mm-hmm. year, later, weeks later when it's ready. It's like, don't think. Well, I keep queuing and looking at the site. See, I can't find an appointment. I can't find an appointment. I'm panicking. I'm running out of time. Look at other places. On our page, before Brexit, we had um, I basically used to go in every day and look at all the central locations through Spain and put up there. This place has got appointments. This place has got appointments. This place hasn't got any appointments. And I, I'd do that either every day or two or three times a week. So people could go like, right, well, I can't get an appointment here, but there's appointments tomorrow in these places. So I'll move there. And I'll, I'll probably end up doing that again this time because that's it, it is likely to happen. Like you said, there's places in the, in Spain where there's a lot of UK nationals now live mm-hmm. and they're going to be queuing out the door to get in. So look at all the places. And so we'll mm-hmm. be putting up a, a page saying, right, these places I've got availability. Get on a mm-hmm. train or catch a bus or what because obviously if you can't drive at the minute you're kind of a bit stuffed getting to all the places so you need to look at places what are near a station or near public transport so you can actually physically get there because if your license is now expired because you've been here more than six months mm-hmm. you can't drive anyway so you don't want to be going somewhere remote where you, you've got to get a mini car to get there unless you've got somebody can drive you of course or tax money but yeah mm-hmm. keep that, bear that in mind. So that's, that's your, your, your get your driving license sorted get you have to get your tie sorted first then your driving license because that's the, the next thing that's got a time limit on it um, what else? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. There's a nice discussion. There's a nice discussion going on in the live chat there, all about oh, yeah. Irish Irish citizenship. Have you have you answered all your questions that you were looking for? Is that um, yes, Glenn? Have you had all your answers from math there? That's interesting. Um, there we go. Oh, there's, uh, there's such a lot of chat going on that I've not been following. Yeah, I'm just, follow I'm just it's making all mixed sure. together, so it's really confusing. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's any questions here that uh, we need to answer. What's Ant saying? If driving license was taxable, do you reckon it would already have been done? Oh, yeah, that's yeah, very good. <laughs> that follows on from what yes, we were moment, asking. Spain makes money out of people having to take the tests, so there's that, a bit of a clue because <clears> the, <throat> the, the driving schools are all run by the government, so there's there's sort of an advantage to it being quite slow. I'm not saying that's why it is. Obviously, there's way more bigger things going off in the whole UK Spain diplomacy thing that are way beyond driving license. So think about Gibraltar, but um, but yeah, it's not really costing Spain any money to not change our licenses. So it's yeah. 
mm -hmm. some would say that's uh, it, it's an advantage, not a disadvantage for them. So they're not really going to break the backs mm -hmm. over it. But I don't think that's really the biggest issue in amongst the whole diplomacy thing. No, very <laughs> yeah. true. Tony's asking an interesting question. Do you keep the categories on your driving license? Right. At the moment, there's nothing that that detail hasn't been put out. They put a lot of details out about what will be possible. Like people who've been here for a long time can still change the licenses. If they change the since they've moved here for a UK one, they can still change the licenses. But categories they haven't specified. Now, most, pretty much every country in the EU has done it because obviously it's all individual states have done their own um, agreements. Car and motorcycle are pretty much across the board. If you've got a UK license, not a Gibraltar or a, um, not a Gibraltar, um, Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, that's a little bit different. They, they get treated differently by different countries, so that will depend. But generally speaking, motorcycle and car will just be a, a straight swap because that's that's across the board, across the whole of the EU. Once you start looking at the higher categories, um, category Cs, Ds and above, that's different. And there's, I don't think there's anywhere that said that you could take an HGV licence, for example, and just purely swap it. I think if you wanted to take something that's a professional licence, that kind of level, you, chances are you're going to have to take your test again here. It might yeah. not be the same level. It might be like not be a full, you know, the whole the whole test that you had to do in the UK to get your HGV in the first place. They quite have to do like a, a half an hour um, on the road. Um, are you basically able to drive? Look at what you're driving. So there are, there are ways of of country, individual countries saying, right, yeah, you don't have to do a full test, but you have to be. We have to check to make sure you're good enough to do this. So uh, we don't know what Spain's going to do with theirs. But if you've got A and B, so your motorcycle and your car licenses. I can't imagine that not being a case of everyone can just purely swap those across. Everything mm -hmm. above that, mm -hmm. C, a lot of countries are doing C, <clears throat> C is fine, but or, or the, the trailer licenses, so you've got your C plus E, if you took that as a, as a separate, that's been swapped. So, yeah, it's, it's a, once again, it's a, we don't actually know yet, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you've got a car and a motorcycle, don't worry about it. If you've got anything professional level, yeah, you might have you might have to do something extra, not necessarily a full thing, but something extra to get that put onto your license. And your license will be five years um, longevity as well, because anything professional level is a shorter license because you get mm -hmm. to physically get physical every year. Your physical is actually more, or your your medical checks more in depth as well for those higher levels. So it's a high level check, and it's a shorter license if you want something that's decent, such like. So. Mm -hmm. and for those of people who uh, had UK licenses and didn't want to wait for the license exchange and have just uh, passed their test yeah I found out that of course you can't swap all no of the categories bike. you can only do the one that you've taken the driving the test, test for in. yeah yeah that's a problem so you've got motorcycle if you've got full motorcycle on your on your test you took your car test here you're now back to back to the same level you were you're basically back off mopeds essentially you you mm. you've got to do two years experience in your, in your car test before then you get the, the your motorbike test and things like that and it's obviously that's really annoying if you're your motorcyclist so it's hopefully mm. we'll get more detail the, the the moment this this boe is released and it becomes live it'll actually have the facts in there and we say like oh, yeah these things these people who had legacy licenses and they've swapped part of it they can swap rest of it or or, or not i think so because that's why i think it's been so complicated and how, how long it's been taken to sort things out. Because things like, it used to be the case, if you change your UK license for a new one, whilst you were a resident of Spain, you were not allowed to change that license because that license was void. Because you were a resident of Spain, you can't have a UK license, so you weren't allowed to change your license in the UK mm -hmm. because you basically lied to say that you're a UK resident and you're not. But the vet basically said that you could do that. If you had to change your UK license, because you can't change it in Spain because of this whole chaos, your, you can still change that license even though it's it's newer than your residency is. So this they've done they have definitely done special things to accommodate the fact that it's taken so long for them to to organise it. So you can't really say is it, is it the same as French as the French system is it the same as the German system. We don't know because every every country is doing their own little thing and they have worked. I know it's taken a long time, but they have done extra things for UK pass, uh, license holders. So. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, those people with legacy licences that have swapped in between, that those things should come back in again. Mm, that'll be interesting. Um, yeah. There was a question that was asked a couple of days ago. Oh, it might have been just yesterday. I think it may have been on after Brexit in Spain. And there was a German licence holder who lost her German licence. Uh, hadn't swapped it for a Spanish one yet, but she's lost the licence. She'd asked the question and nobody's actually answered it yet. It'd be interesting to know, what do you do if you lose your, your foreign licence? 
you can you can apply if, as in, if it physically just physically lost it as opposed to having it removed from you by the authorities. Yeah. <clears throat> then, yeah. Lost the card, yeah. As well, yeah, you apply it to the country that the license issued issued license in the first place and they should give you a certificate to say that you are, are a license holder for that country you will have to go swap it for a spanish one now because you, you can't renew that because you're not a, a german resident anymore you've got to have a spanish license or you've got to swap mm. it for a spanish license now because it's it's no longer an existence the piece of card is no longer in existence so mm. um but yeah you should be able to get all, uh, information about all of your um previous uh, your categories and such like from from germany anyway and then use that when you go to the um, policia to say like that says oh to DGT sorry, DGT and say like I have a license and they can check anyway because Spain will obviously talk to Germany. That was, that was a problem why when we left the EU, why the UK and Spain don't talk to each other because we're no longer sharing information. Whereas of course Spain and Germany will still share information, so the, um, D DGT will be able to find out from Germany that your license is a real license. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, to do that way, but yeah, it should be able to whatever it's called in Germany, they should be able to issue that certificate. That, Tells yes. you what you're to. Brilliant. Neil is saying, my wife is Spanish. When she came to live in the UK 30 years ago, she exchanged the Spanish license for a UK one. What are your thoughts on her getting her Spanish license back? Yeah, she can do that. That, that way. I, I just brought that actually in the, in the, the comments coming up there. Um, yeah, if you if someone took their test in Spain originally, so they are whether they were Spanish or whether, whatever, as long as they took their test for the first time and it was Spain that said, you are a licensed driver, when you come back to Spain, you can go to DHT and you can have that license um uh, re-established or whatever word. It's, it's exactly the same for a, a British citizen. If if you've swapped your license for a Spanish license, you go back to the UK. You could just say to DVLA, "I'm back here. I want my license back," and they will issue your license. So it's the same system. There's not really I can't say there's a, a form for doing it or a, a, an appointment for doing it, but yeah, you, you, you need to speak to GDT and they they find your record because you it was Spain that said you could drive in the first place. So Spain um, will then say you can continue to drive now. So yeah, she should be able to go back and get that. So anyone taking the test in Spain originally, as a as a as a new driver, then yeah, you can get your license back, get reestablished, or whatever the word is, mm -hmm. <laughs> reissued or one of the... reissued. Yeah, that would be the one. There we go. There's talk going on in the live chat about it's stamping the passport again. Oh yeah, yeah. Phil said we came from France, so no border stamp. There, obviously, going from France to Spain. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. If you're emigrating, migrating from France without so not coming across the border, yeah, you can. I know there's 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 a solution for that. I know because I've always well said you can go to the police and and have it have that done. You can go and request it be done. I, because basically, all I'm saying is, am I in the country? Yes, you are. I think so. You mm -hmm. can either do it at um, an external um, border point, like an airport or a ferry port that's near you. That's that's obviously an external border to the EU. Mm -hmm. Or there are places you can do it actually in um, Spain itself. It's, mm -hmm. it's basically proven when you enter the country, and I say that's difficult. If you're moving from France, then you you don't cross a border apart from the internal border, and that's got no um, no one there to do anything for you because they don't stamp internal. That's Phil point. thought ahead and said they kept their last fuel receipts in France, first fuel receipts in Spain, yeah, hotel yeah. receipts in Spain, and then we kept every receipt. Well done, Phil. From arriving in Spain, it's got, I've got a little box with everything in it. And uh, yeah. to the date we had attended the police station for the visa, so that was, yeah. That yeah. Policy yeah, it's, it's, it's not evidence, really. Yeah, because like I say, like I said before, the day you enter the, uh, Spain is the day you become a resident. That's when you'll backdate your, your card to. So... You've got to be able to prove when that happened, and the, the simplest every every functionario in the office is going to go. Well, you've got to stamp on your passport. Easy. Mm -hmm. Everything else takes a bit more work. Therefore, the, the, what they want is to see the stamp on a passport. Easy. All I go is that date. That's a date, and we go from there. If mm -hmm. they've got to start reading through stuff, yeah, the, the less less keen on it. But somebody a functionario who's got a bit of nonce about, and we've got like say, we'll say right, okay, yeah you've been here from that date we can see you've been here from that date and it'll work and it, it's not it's not always the case they'll say no absolutely not we're not going to give you any residency because you're not here because they can physically see you're here because yeah. you're in front of them <laughs> it's, it's one of those where if you've got somebody who all, all they're doing is following the list blindly they're not got nothing not thinking outside of that list then then you'll have a problem because all they want to say is that passport visa stamped yeah and nothing more than that because they don't want to see that passport being used that visa i should say being used again because the whole point is it can be used once so it's kind of like they need that stamp to say that that visa has been killed off. That visa is no longer live because it's been stamped. If they're not been stamped, then like, oh, well, what to do now? Mm. But yeah, so the easiest way, if you can, get it stamped. If you're not crossing an external border or you end up with someone for some reason doesn't want to stamp it, which is a bit weird. Yeah. 
they said, well, stamp everything <laughs> when you come across the wall. You'll have stamps whether you like it or not. So, but it, yeah, it's, it's a really good idea that is collect all the information and you've got, you've got a big old trail of information. They, they can't really go, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know because how can they not know? So yeah, there's a, mm -hmm. Records of everything is always really handy, and that's kind of handy in the 21st century because we've all got plastic cards for buying things with, and it'll tell you exactly where you spent that money. So you, everyone can get, even if you haven't got receipts for everything, if you've paid for everything by card, and you can mm -hmm. do your toll by card, everything, you can go, here's my bank statement. It says, these are the things that I've done in the last six months, whatever, and, mm -hmm. and it, you have evidence there. So it's a lot easier now than it used to be. If you only pay cash for everything, then obviously, yeah, you're going to have to have receipts because cash doesn't is it traceable so you don't know where you've been mm. so yeah there this, we this go seems... math is saying if you wish to get permanent residency after five years on the nlv the 10 months in five years being the max you can be out of spain yeah. well done for that research uh, does that include moving around the schengen area well interesting point where's the proof that you've moved because they've not exactly, stamped your passport yeah. at yeah. the border to france for example or belgium or somewhere like that yeah. Exactly. It's it is it's up to they basically they can say, right, you need to prove to me you've been in Spain all the time apart from ten months in that five years. Mm -hmm. Now, how how traceable that is is difficult and how if you've been you've been spending having your holidays in France and, and Belgium or whatever, it's like I say it's very difficult to see where you've moved back and forth. It might be a bit different when ESS comes in fully online because that's going to use number plate recognition and all sorts of stuff. So internal borders can get checked as well. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, that's 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 not the technology is not uh, up to speed on that yet. You, you've got to be able to be confident in yourself that you can prove that you've been here all of that time. Mm -hmm. And if if you can't do that, or you've got, if, oh, it's going to be very difficult for you to do that because you haven't. Then you've got to bear that in. That that's, that could be problematic. But mm -hmm. like I say, it's, it is up to you. As the person applying or to renew, it's up to you to give them the evidence that you've done that. And if you can't yeah. do that, then you might have a problem. How so, tight they're going to be if you're if you're if you're basically to France, you know, twice a week to do your shopping because you live on the border, or whatever. Then it's it's going to be a bit complicated because yeah, yeah. Because if you you might be shopping in France, <laughs> and it would be cheap to shop in France. But if if mm. there was something you need to go to France every week to buy something because you're going to get in France. And every week you're spending your 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 cash card in France, then that looks up suspect because you in France every week. But then again, you might also have transactions every week in Spain. So it's yeah, it's mm -hmm. gonna be one of those things that if you if you are gonna really kick the back tide out of it and not be in Spain for a lot of time because you but only be in Portugal and France or other local EU countries. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so the basic answer to your Honestly, question Matt, is that it does not include moving around the Schengen area. You've got to be physically no. in Spain. Yeah, it's it's because... it's Spain. Spain want you in Spain every all the time, apart from those ten months that you're allowed out. When you're on a visa, obviously it's different for withdrawal agreement. People, you only got to do six months per year, so it's it is a little bit different if you're on a withdrawal agreement. But if you're on a visa, which obviously most new people are, then yeah, that's that ten months is is strict, but it's going to be down to you to prove that you met that criteria. So if they say to you, would it think you've been here, then you're going to have to be able to prove that you have been here. So don't give mm. them the reason to think you haven't been here, essentially. Exactly. But Good. Yeah, that, it's, that, it's definitely, it's in Spain. It's it's not not in Schengen. It's not Schengen residency. It's Spain, Spanish residency. Exactly, yeah. I've yeah. got some, I've got loads of really, really short YouTube videos that are coming out over the next few days, um, which are all part of one big video that i did about the 8180 rule uh, 8180 9180 rule that would be interesting uh, <laughs> yeah and those questions are all answered yeah, yeah, on those yeah, videos as yeah. well so we've got yeah, yeah. i've got one coming out at, at midday today and, and they <laughs> they seem to be being watched at two o'clock every day so i'm guessing that they're being watched on the east coast of america <laughs> suddenly loads of people come on and they're, they're watching these YouTube shorts oh, even though I put them out at 8 o'clock in the morning and nobody watches them till 2 o'clock in the afternoon so maybe these things are more popular in America I'm, I'm finding that That's out more of them, I suppose. yeah yeah absolutely um, any more top tips before I, Ooh, what a... else do we have uh, oh, well, well what I was going to say which actually, actually predates the getting your driving licence thing is about getting uh, your, your appointment your CETA for your, your TIE now I know it's in some places it's really difficult to get one, and mm -hmm. I know people some people get um, Hester's and things like to get them for them. Um, it is difficult, and 
And in some places it's not, some places it's dead easy. People be like, what are you on about? I just went online and there it was. But there's other places where it's it's very, very difficult to get an appointment. And, that, mm-hmm. and this, is a, this, is a, this is a really, it's difficult, but the best way to do it, I found, was basically get on the computer first thing in the morning and then stay at it all day, two or three times a day. Ah, oh, that's the one, yeah. That's um, the one. Just keep, keep going. Like literally every 20 minutes, logging in there, logging in there, logging in. And you can be sat there all day doing that, but... Um, if people cancel an appointment, they disappear. The moment they're cancelled, they appear on the site. They not, don't come necessarily come out of batch. I mean, obviously, the, the office will put out a batch at a certain point in time, but, and that changes depending what office it is. So you might be a Sunday morning they put out a batch. It might be Tuesday midnight they put out a batch. So it will mm-hmm. depend on your office. But any cancellations will appear just throughout the day as a cancelled. So if you, you need to sit there and just keep plugging away at it, and it's tedious... But mm-hmm. that's one way of actually getting an appointment because uh, we were trying to get appointments, obviously, when it was running up to the end of um, Brexit and everyone was like panicking. Um, so th- there's a lot of places where were just swamped. And that mm-hmm. was where I did it. I, I got on the computer at seven in the morning and every 20 minutes I was going in there. So you can go do all the things in between time, but go onto the site and do it. And mm-hmm. at three o'clock in the afternoon, I got an appointment, which is a tedious, <laughs> lots of hours of my life. But then yeah. at the end, of it, you know, we were sorted with, with the card. So it's. It's a bit, bit, bit rubbish, but it's one way of doing it. Or try and find work out where your office releases the batches because I do release them, generally speaking, on a weekly or 10-day basis. So the mm-hmm. glut will come out. But unfortunately, all the Hesters and um, lawyers in your area will also know that. So that's why they can always get them quicker because they know when the batch is coming out so they can set it up so they can get 10 or so in case they're needed. And that's them putting them back in the system when they don't need them is when mm-hmm. you get these cancellations coming up. Which also seems to happen a lot at mid, well, at lunchtime, Spanish time. Mm. I think it's one of those things they go off for lunch, they come back and go, oh, I don't need these appointments. No one's booked him. I'll chuck him back into the system, which is yeah. probably why it's easier to get them sort of at two, between two and three in the afternoon, because that's when people are back to the office. They don't want to do any hard work, but it's worth cancel yeah. appointments. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And that problem with getting your TIE appointment is what caused this question from yeah, yeah. Uh, Alexandra. Alex and yeah. what's the score she's saying with leaving the country and coming back in if you don't yet have your tie for a start you've got your resguardo showing that you've actually applied yeah. for it presumably that's what she'd done but do yeah. you need to have your permiso de autorización de estancia and this yeah, yeah this depends on where you're from and what you've done <laughs> mm-hmm. well, basically because uk nationals are schengen wavered we don't need um, a, a visa to enter the EU, well, at the Schengen zone, technically, mm-hmm. um, we can travel in out without any paperwork. We don't need that paperwork. So if a person's got Schengen allowance left, which if you've been here 90 days on your residency, you should have because you've not been outside of Spain at all in that time, then your um, Schengen allowance should have re- restarted. You've, obviously, you've, you've gone long enough out um, in, in the country of residency because Spain's your country of residency now. Mm-hmm. You should have time back again. So you should be able to travel in and out on your Schengen allowance. You shouldn't need to have a visa to travel because <clears throat> theoretically your UK passports allows you to travel without any kind of visa paperwork because your Schengen is wavered. Mm-hmm. If you've, it will also depend on how long you've been in Spain before you got your, because some people come early and then go back, collect the visa and come back. It depends how long of course you've been here waiting because you might have used your 90 days and then you haven't got 90 days yet because you haven't been in Spain 90 days. Mm-hmm. So that's residence time. So the res- resguardo, um, the um, regresso is mm-hmm. one way of doing it. So you definitely know that you've got a piece of paper that says I can enter Spain or enter Schengen, essentially, because mm-hmm. otherwise if Schengen's gone and your visa is because you're stamped because you've entered, you've got no permission to come into uh, Schengen zone. So that and that actual certificate you get for the police station will get, let you let you back in. So it's your ticket to get back in the country. So that's your uh, author- authorization. Well, uh, regresso, your, mm-hmm. your right to return, basically. So that's that's why we're doing it. I don't know. It's, it's about twenty euros, I think. Um, mm-hmm. It's a form you fill in, and you go to the police station, and, and you, you pay your euros over, and then you get this, and you can you can flip back and forth then. Or yeah. Out and pack it. So and it's just like thing. an extra proof that you yeah, can get back in receipt, on top of the resguardo. Say, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing is, that most res- resguardos actually have got a time limit on them. Uh, I think they tend to be forty-five days, which is oh kind yeah. Of a bit so um, I know ours was 45 days, but we didn't get our cards until later than that. Um, mm. And they don't seem to be that bothered. And if you went back and said, well, my cards, my, my receipts run out now, 45 days have passed, I sort of go, whatever, because they don't mm. expect you to leave 
I think, more yeah. than anything. So I'll just stay here because people have to leave. People have got funerals to go to. People have got things that have to do outside of Spain and mm-hmm. some things you can't plan for. Some things you can plan for, but other things you can't. And you need to leave the country. Then you can get this um, certificate to basically re-enter after you've gone out. Um, so that's that's one way of, of doing that is getting back mm-hmm. in. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the official route, basically, for people who don't have any... Things like Schengen waivers and 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 such like, and if you miss Guardos and run out, um, mm-hmm. it's it's a, it's a really it's a it's a very it's a more official in a way than the Resguardo. A Resguardo in a way works like it's a receipt. It's a bit like your temporary license you get when you change your license. You get a piece of paper when you've had a UK card in. You wait for your plastic card from Spain. Mm-hmm. You get this piece of A4 paper that's like we printed off in the office, and it's a bit. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. In Spain, it's not a problem because Spanish police know exactly what it is and they recognise what you're doing. Whereas if you, you can't use that anywhere else in, in the in the EU because they just go, "What the hell's this piece of paper?" Because it's, it's not their paperwork that they don't recognise it as being official. And in yeah. a way, there is well, a little bit like that. You find for you're milling around in, in in Spain because theoretically, as a UK or any foreigner should have their ID with them, passport in our case, and a piece of paper would say they're allowed to be here, which is the resguardo. And for Spain, that's fine because it's that piece of paper. Whereas you're crossing a border in France or you, wherever you're crossing a border, um, that's it's not quite official enough. Whereas, of course, the, the Regreso is an official document, a more official. It's probably still a piece of A4 paper, but it's mm-hmm. it's more that's now it's on file kind of thing for, for border crossing. So it's, you know, yeah, yeah. It's and, of course, the, the, and of course, they can check on their system if you stop by the police anywhere in Spain. Exactly. Yeah, Maybe. exactly. You, you've recorded your your, that, your your NIE number links you to everything in Spain. Whatever you're doing in Spain, that, that little number is going to connect you to everything. So mm-hmm. they can just go, hey, who are you? Where do you work? Where, where do yeah. you pay your taxes? Blah, blah, blah. It's all right in that little little box. So, Absolutely. Yeah, There's a, Glenn says, a question that I've answered on one of my YouTube shorts and on the 9180 thing. Do you think the 9180 day limit will be abolished in the near future, as in here, France and Spain are not happy with it? The thing is, it's something that Spain can do if, they want, if they've got a reason to do it, because that's what Spain's done, uh, France has done. France have got a, a, a visa that allows you to go and be basic, a, a bit like the 90 days allows you to do. You can be a tourist, you can do, you can study, that kind of thing, and you can stay for, that's, for a longer period, that's a six month period you can do that for, and mm-hmm. that was France's idea to do that. That's that, that and that's fine because any every country can do their own little um, variations. Um, mm-hmm. And if Spain wants to do that, there was no reason they can't do that. There's no EU won't stop them doing that, um, but it would have to be in Spain's advantage to do it. And then you know, Spain would want a reason for it to be worthwhile. And at a moment, I think there's too many other things occurring between Spain and UK yeah. for them really to want to put time and effort into extending the the, the um, the holiday time basically mm-hmm. um, because it's it, it's far too it's, it's so much politics between the uk and spain that these things are a little bit less important i mean they're important to the individual wanting it but as mm-hmm. far as the government is concerned they're not important because people can come to spain if they want to come to spain they have a limit for doing that but they are free to come to spain for three three months at a time mm-hmm. there's no urgency in it because what's the mm-hmm. advantage and spain it's important think- to realize it's important to realise that the 98180 limit is a Schengen limit, and that's something yes. that Spain can't change. But yes, exactly, and that's a yeah. visa waiver that we've already yeah. got, and the Schengen visa is exactly. different. Exactly. So, yeah, the but French, they, they the could produce you, a holiday visa, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a specific visa. You have to apply. You can't just go to France and stay there for 180 days. You have got to apply to have that permission to do it. It's simple to do, and you don't need to be. There's not, nothing technical about it as such. But you have to have a visa. It's a visa. It's not a Schengen get around as such Schengen applies the visa is what lets you stay that in in france for that long, longer period of time so it's it, yeah like i say schengen is schengen schengen 19180 is the whole of the schengen zone and um france cannot change that spain cannot change that france, they, have, they have no influence over that um sort of eu-wide policy or eu schengen-wide policy so it has to be a separate mechanism created by that country so if spain mm. wants to create one they can do there's nothing to stop them doing that it's whether they've got the political um, enthusiasm power, <laughs> enthusiasm for it, whether it's going to be a benefit. If it's, it looks like it's going to be a benefit for them in the future, it's going to, you know, people come and come here for six months and do the, the, the overwintering again, and that looks financially advantageous to, to Spain, then they'll do it. If it's not going to have any benefit to Spain, it's going to be hard to police or manage, or it's going to create more paperwork to do, because obviously you've got to apply for a visa, therefore there's going to be someone to process that visa, they, they might not do it. 
So it's it's one of those things again. Spain's got to have the willpower to do it, and it's up, they can if they want to. There's no reason they can't, but whether they will. And at the moment, with it been the way it is with um, Gibraltar and other such things going on, it's it's they're not they're not here to do us favors. Basically, <laughs> they're, yeah. they're there to do the basic they need to do to have the two countries running, and and everything else is a little bit. Hence, the driving license is taking so long. It doesn't. The neither government care. Thus, it's not affecting the, the government at a government level. It's affecting mm-hmm. us as, as individual people. And um, there is mechanisms around it. We can learn to drive if we want to it by taking a Spanish test. Therefore, we're not permit, we're not prohibited from driving in Spain. We just have to do something that already exists in order mm-hmm. to be able to drive here. So there's no, um, yeah, there's no kind of influence to make the government work faster on it. Because why? Yeah. Because they're not breaking the law by not doing it. You know. Exactly. You can go and do your test if if that was if you need to drive, you could do a test. So as far as, far as the, the governments are concerned, it's not their not at that at their level. They're not that interested. And the, mm-hmm. the same will be for the one eighty. If it's not affecting them in any way, it's it's something you can do as a as a nice to have, but it's not a, a need to have. Okay. Yeah, so don't hold yeah. your breath is the simple yeah. answer. <laughs> if it happens, it'll happen. If it doesn't, yeah. there's not much we can do to influence it, I don't think. As so, we've come up to the hour, and normally I'd no, say it. on the on hour, as usual. I've written, no, that's perfectly fine. If you've got any more top tips, while um, we're, while we're, we're about to, the, the, the local ones was like involve yourself in your community, don't don't isolate yourself, and learn a language or languages, depending where you live, of course, because you might have to. So, mm-hmm. that, that my, my final ones were involve yourself, don't just move here, and that's it, you're here, get here, and continue continue your uh, exploration of spain don't just leave that for your, your um before you moved here you did all the investigation and you get here you stop that mm. when you get here continue learn about your area and one day you might want to get citizenship here in which learning about your area learning about Spanish, spain and its history and this language obviously are all parts of, of that citizenship and of course once you're a citizen you have to mean an eu citizen so mm-hmm. there you go <laughs> Fortunately, I'm already one of those. I, I managed to <laughs> grab my Irish citizenship while we were living in Ireland. So that's very handy. That's why I can answer all of these questions about Irish citizenship because exactly, I yes. researched it in you. depth. So, there we go. So any questions from people on the live chat before we round up the show? There's a 20 second delay, so I'll just chatter on for a, a couple of seconds. If you have any more questions that we miss out or you're watching afterwards then put them in the youtube comments below (laughs) and they'll get answered as soon as i can um and in a moment i'll tell you what's going to be on the show next week excuse me um there we go oh math says excellent advice rachel i plan to learn basque language too very interesting yeah that's very different that's a little bit easier than basque you've got to learn learn how to use the letter x so there's, there's not many words with X in Spain and K's. Yeah, it looks yes. completely different. It looks it looks yeah. a bit more a little bit more Greek. That's what I thought it looked when when I saw yeah. the road signs. It's definitely yeah. very different to uh, to Castilian. Doesn't yeah, it? and get learn to like pinchos if you're moving up. Yeah, there. that's that's quite easy though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It. And basically, it's just a bit of bread with stuff on top, isn't it? Yes. Generally, that this much bread, and where we are, that much um, tortilla, as in uh, egg and potato tortilla, which I was like, it's, it's very carb heavy. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Potatoes, potatoes on bread. Potatoes well, on bread. It, it isn't chip butty, I suppose, but Spanish style. Yeah, that's the English version. The Irish version, we, every Irish restaurant we went to, I've said this before on the show, they would usually serve, if it's a meat dish, they'd serve it on a bed of mashed potato. <laughs> and then they'd bring the vegetables and there'd be new potatoes with the vegetables and they'd ask you, do you want chips with that? <laughs> and then they'd bring the bread. <laughs> oh, need carbs. you got to keep warm in Ireland. Though. That's that's the thing, isn't it? And that's kind of what we need to do up here, I guess, in Astorius. We need we need some, some carbs for the uh, for insulation. Yeah. That's absolutely. Makes so we've had no more questions on the live chat. So let's let's round it up. I think let's let's say a massive... Thank you, everybody, to Rachel and give her a big virtual hug for being so wonderful as usual. Oh, we've got a, oh, it was a quick late question. Here we go. Oh, question. Uh, uh, well done, Desmond. Got there before the bar. So do Irish citizens with UK driving license have to take a Spanish driving test? 
You don't necessarily have to take a test because obviously if this agreement comes in, you can swap it. But yeah, it's your license that's important. If UK issued your license, that's where the problem lies. If you had an Irish license, then that's EU and they can converse with each other. If your license, no matter where you're from, is a UK license, then that's the problem you've got. You've got six months to change it, and hopefully that will be by swapping it, not taking your test at some point soon. So, but yeah, it's 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 your license issuing country that's the the important factor. And if it's if it's a UK license, it's a DVA issue license, and they won't talk to DVLA. So, oh, yeah. at the moment, the DVLA. Hopefully, there will be soon, so we can then start swapping licenses. Yes, indeed, yeah. that's good advice for anybody who's moving. Actually, it's the passport that you hold that's the important thing not yeah. the country that you're from so exactly. if you've is that moving your moving your goods if you're an irish citizen who lives in the uk and you want to move your washing machine over you're still um subject to taxes because mm -hmm. it's it's where it's moving from that's important mm -hmm. not the passport of the person who owns it if it's moving from ireland yeah that is tax free or mm -hmm. tax free if you're moving it from the uk if you're moving it into the customs area no matter what passport you hold that is bringing it be coming into the eu from outside so mm -hmm. it's always down to where the thing is from. And if your license is from the UK, then it's it's not valid. It's only valid for six months and then it has to be changed. So. Excellent. So has that cleared that one up for you, Desmond? I hope so. Desmond O'Hara. Great Irish name. Ah. There we go. Just so Irish license before you move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was <laughs> that was very important. I, I was did some amazing stuff that that amazed all of the Irish people. Well, I managed to get my Irish driving license within mm -hmm. only two or three months of arriving. Managed to get uh, the equivalent of the NIE number, which is called the PSI, PRS, PRS number, um, mm -hmm. which is the one that allows you to work or do any kind of yeah. financial, it's your business financial transactions. Yeah. Managed to get that very, very quickly. And it was one of those amazing experiences. We didn't know where the office was. We knew it was in Killarney for, for Kerry and, and drove into the town. And we went, oh, there it is on the side of the road. And there was a parking space right outside the door. We walked wow. in through the door and we thought, we've got to take a ticket. We walked towards the place where you take your ticket from. And somebody walked out of the office just over to our right and went, uh, next one, can we come over here? And we went straight in and just wow. sat down, got it on the computer. We were in and out in about 15 minutes. So wow. if only it was I mean, like that in Spain, you know, but yeah, maybe it can be in some places. Some places it works brutally in other places. I mean, our driving licenses were very easy to get because obviously we were pre-Brexit. So our driving licenses were very simple to get. But I imagine there was other places at exactly the same point in time in history that were extremely difficult to get. So it is going to depend just on the office of where you are and just the day you fall, I think. It's, uh, it's one of those, you can be lucky or you can not be lucky. Yes. Yeah. Well, so thank you once again. We've already said thank you, but I'm going to say thank you again. And uh, <laughs> you've been wonderful. And we'll, we'll always pleasure. be staying in touch. And I'm sure we'll have you on the show again in the not too distant future. But okay, until then. then, see you on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye for now. All right. Bye for now. Bye. There we go. So, well, wasn't that lovely? Lots of full and interesting answers and loads of great questions on the live chat thank you for that everybody don't forget to click on the like button over here somewhere under your screen and subscribe if you haven't done it already so you'll be the first to know what's coming up on the live shows and the midweek videos and also these youtube shorts you'll get them in your youtube feed somewhere if you haven't seen those check them out because they they come through really quickly and um, it's always good to to click on those and uh, check out i'm usually playing some kind of character on them and uh, they can be funny and easy to look at any time of day uh, next saturday then on the show we have chris from upsticks back once again to answer more of your questions about visas residency and uh, driving and and more and we'll have a special focus on whatever is hot news at the moment whatever the update that's going to happen in the coming days you can of course ask questions in advance on our facebook group or you can ask them on after brexit in spain as well do check that out and uh, join in with that if you're a lovely person if you're a troll just stay away and um, get your thinking caps on and write in with any questions and we'll see you next saturday morning at the regular time of nine o'clock if you're in the uk or ireland 
or 10 o'clock if you're in Spain or Central Europe or work out the rest of the times yourself if you're in America or Australia or anywhere else. I can't wait. Don't forget you can get free yoga and meditation classes on my lovely wife Liz's YouTube YouTube channel. It's the new teeth. Um, it's called YouTube Yoga and Aromatherapy. So look out for that. The link is down below with the other ones. And that's all for this week. Someone pass around the cookies and uh, peace and love to you all. Let's have a dive in the pool. See if it, Do you think it's warm enough yet? Liz took a dip in our pool the other day and said she didn't get further than, uh, the, than legs. So anyway, peace and love to you all. We will see you soon. And here comes the music to dance to. It's Cosmic. Bye for now.